the Planck's black body radiation law is what um, actually led to the correct prediction. <laughs> I put quotation around the prediction because it's not a prediction at all. It's something that everyone knew. Planck law is the one that actually fits to the experimental curve correctly. And for this Planck law, he had to introduce a poorly justified assumption. The only justification he had for this assumption was that it gave him the correct result. Really, he had no other justification. And this is the thing that I want to take away from black body radiation. This is the most important thing. Planck's assumption that um, energy of oscillators. So energy of, so you know, you treat uh, black body, so this is the thing that you saw that was really hot on <laughs> Tuesday. You treat black body as being made up of um, charged oscillators that can take some amount of energy. You say that this amount of energy that can be in the oscillators, energy of oscillators, come in units of some constant that we now call Planck's constant times frequency. So if it's coming in units of this, the only coefficient that can go here is an integer. So this is an integer. And this is what we call now Planck's constant. And it's a very small number that has unit of joule times a second. Um, in your lab manual, there's a value there. So for some reason, I can never memorize this number. <laughs> but it's a very small number. Um, yeah, I don't think I, I have electron charge memorized, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 colon, but somehow I can never memorize this number. Um, but anyways, but this is the main takeaway, that Planck had to assume this to get this correct result that we saw. And what we are going to see today is that, um, I don't know what the right way to say this was. So Planck was restricting this assumption to these mysterious oscillators, mysterious black bodies. And it turns out he was not being bold enough. So when you first look at this, you know, it, it's an assumption, like where's your justification? Turns out Planck was just being way too careful because it turns out this relationship applies much more broadly. So the first thing we want to look at is something called the photoelectric effect. And I thought I would start out with a video because it's uh, easier to kind of see the demonstration that way. Your lab today is, by the way, photoelectric effect. So you'll be doing actual concrete measurements based on that effect. But there's um, this, I found this while I was searching for physics 10 material. We use this natural light instead of uh, the uh, uh, carbon arc we had inside, and we could use this simple electroscope instead of all that elaborate equipment that we had inside. Uh, Bill has put a glass plate on the front of it to protect the needle from the wind, and uh, he's wrapped the glass plate with wires to uh, shield the needle from any electric charge that might be on the plate. The wires are connected to the can of the electroscope. And now will you put a negative charge on the electroscope with that uh, plastic rod that uh, gives a negative charge? Uh, here uh, <coughs> is a piece of lead foil. And if uh, you'd hand me a, uh, some of the steel wool, I'll get it clean. We'll put it on the uh, uh, electroscope. And uh, of course, when I touch the electroscope, that discharges it. If you give me the piece of glass and uh, charge it negatively, I'll uh, hold this glass in front of the lead. And there we have a charge. Now I remove the glass and uh, we see that the uh, electroscope isn't discharging. Now I'll try uh, magnesium. Uh, this uh, has to have uh, its oxide removed too. And 
I'll bend it and put it on here. And uh, now if you charge that negatively, we'll uh, see that the it isn't discharging with the glass in place, but if we take the glass away and let the sun fall on, it discharges, put the glass back, we s slow the discharge up and take it away and it discharges much more rapidly. Let's do the experiment once more. This time, with the electroscope charged positively with a different uh, plastic that gives a positive charge when it's rubbed. And now when I take the glass out, the electroscope doesn't discharge with the magnesium plate on it as it did before. Right, so that's a little demonstration. As you can see, it's actually a pretty simple experiment you can imagine doing. Now, in your setup, you know, they are kind of all hidden inside the black boxes, so it makes it harder for you to see that. But what the measurements you will be making of current that which you have to kind of trust to your control box is um, uh, that's uh, coming from this effect. So, so. The first time people noticed that photoelectric effect was, I think, I don't know, late 19th century. So when people were working the light, they noticed this effect. As you can see, it's a pretty simple experiment. Once you kind of notice the weird thing, then you know, people can do it. So, and it's almost um, tantalizing because you feel like you should be able to explain it. Let me just uh, sketch what photoelectric in effect involves. So in photoelectric effect, what you are seeing, or you know how you would explain what you see, like what you saw in the video, is you would say, okay, I have some metal surface on which some light is shining on. So you have light shining on it, and what you are observing, or how you explain what you are observing is that as light shines on it, some electrons pop out, or you get, you know, I guess something like cathode ray. Um, you, you see electrons popping out of the surface as light shines, shines on it. Now, just to, you know, imagine you are someone, uh, a physicist working in the late 19th century. So this is after a development of Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. And so you know about electromagnetic waves. And this is when um, a guy named J.J. Thompson have discovered the electron. I think he discovered in like 1890 something. So electron is known as a particle. People have been working the cathode ray tubes. So how would you explain what you are seeing here? Where would the, uh, first, your first starting place be? Like why would light interact with the discharged particle in the first place? Is there something about light you know that would you would say, oh, that, that should interact with the charged particle? Yeah, light is made up of electro, electric and magnetic field. So what we describe as light, it's an oscillation of electric field and magnetic field. So you know, I could describe light kind of this way. It would look something like you know, wave of or os <laughs> I was told <laughs> to avoid the saying way because some people don't. So you have this uh, kind of, so this, uh, these arrows are representing electric field. And as light comes, this is oscillating back and forth. So if you have a charged particle um, sitting here, then um, as this electric field is oscillating, so, so on the very surface you have this electric field that's uh, oscillating back and forth. That's going to cause this charge to feel a force due to this oscillating electric field. It's going to be shaken. You can imagine that this charge will, maybe as it's being shaken, it might gain enough energy to uh, leave this surface. 
right? So that's what I mean. It's so tantalizingly, tantalizingly close that you feel like you have almost all the pieces you need for explaining this phenomenon, except that there were a couple odd things that you just couldn't explain. Um, let me just, uh, so this is, uh, oh, uh, I guess I can start out with what you saw in the video. The, the really, the, uh, I mean, so you, you can list uh, two or three different things. The biggest thing comes down to this. This, uh, oh, let me not use red. This effect, this entire phenomenon is frequency dependent. Now, I don't know, does it make sense that it should be frequency dependent? You know, so by frequency dependent, I mean, so this, uh, you know, electromagnetic wave of light, if we made it higher frequency, shorter wavelength, then this would be, um, you know, this oscillation would be happening at much greater frequency. Like it'll be uh, flipping back and forth at, you know, double the rate it would be in the red color when it's in the ultraviolet light. Like then just intuitively, like if you have electric field that's flipping back and forth more quickly, then um, does it feel like maybe this should gain more energy? Maybe, yeah, yeah. I mean, so it depends on your intuition. Um, if you feel like, you know, as it's flipping back and forth more quickly, then maybe this should shake more violently? Maybe. Now, so here's the part that you really cannot explain. It's, uh, how do I explain it? Uh, it's what you saw in the video. So you saw with the visible light, absolutely nothing happening. And the visible light, it was pretty bright. And what I'll tell you now is that it, doesn't ma it didn't matter if you made a, it a 60 watt light bulb, if you replaced it with a 600 watt light bulb. So uh, let me qualify this carefully. So it, it's uh, below a threshold frequency, it's uh, intensity, independent. Um, by independent, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter how much intensity you have. If you are below a threshold frequency of light, then nothing happens. Now, this is the part that you just can never explain with the wave model of light, because what, is, what does intensity of light relate to as far as its uh, electromagnetic property goes? The, so the magnitude of electric field, right? If you increase intensity, you are increasing the, um, you know, increasing this uh, magnitude of the electric field. So, you know, if you have a, a charge here, and if you apply large enough electric field, could you apply enough force to make it pop out? And when you do the analysis in classical mechanics, um, like you should be able to, even if you were to look at what is the you know, rate of change of electric field, well, you can keep the frequency the same. So as far as the rate of change of electric field goes, whether you double the frequency or you double the electric field or you know, quadruple the intensity, that should work out the same thing because it's the same sinusoidal thing. You can make this slope steeper by, you know, by, by either increasing the frequency, so decreasing the wavelength, or you can do it by increasing the amplitude. So this is really the biggest piece that um, you can't explain based on classical mechanics, or you cannot base, um, uh, so this cannot be explained by thinking of light as electromagnetic, uh, wait, by thinking of light as electromagnetic wave, because if we, if, all, if that's all the model of light you have, then, um, then um, like, it, it's a very puzzling thing that once you fall below certain frequency that, that, it does, that no matter how strong an electric field you apply, that elect, the photoelectric effect won't happen. And on the flip side, if you have enough frequency, 
kind of, um, so as you reduce the intensity, what you would see is that you would see that the rate of, uh, rate of discharge is slower as you reduce the intensity. But what you would see is that no matter how small the intensity, you would always get some discharge. So that's another thing that's kind of hard to explain. Like, you know, if you reduce intensity enough, then are you just not, simply not shaking the electron enough that it would pop out? So um, I will say this puzzled people long enough, decades. Um, so Einstein got his Nobel Prize in 1921. I think I had to look it up while I was, uh, they had some errors in the UC Berkeley physics lab, so I, historical errors. Physicists are not good his, uh, historians, so I had to fix that when I, when did they say it last? I don't know, 19, eight, sorry, 1890 something. So for more than a decade, some people were studying it and they didn't really have a good explanation. And, um, well, chronologically, this comes first. So I guess, uh, once again, physicists are not good historians. I don't know where Einstein got his inspiration. But it's oddly similar to this. So what Einstein hypothesized was, well, maybe when this electromagnetic wave interacts with uh, particles, maybe the, there's some kind of minimum amount of energy that has to be transferred. So call that minimum change in energy. And this minimum amount of energy that has to be transferred is equal to Planck's constant, which comes from here, times the frequency of electromagnetic wave. So it's oddly similar to this, because if you are saying, um, let's see. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's oddly similar to this. The difference being that um, here we are talking about the frequency of the oscillators. So it, these, you know, these hypothetical oscillators, they are not even real objects because it's a way of modeling uh, a black body. So it's something that's not that's poorly understood. But electromagnetic wave is supposed to be something that's very well understood. It, there's a whole set of four differential equations that tell you exactly how it behaves. But Einstein was uh, making this bold assumption that you could somehow generalize from this and say, well, even for this very well understood thing of electromagnetic wave, that this might be true. And he, in fact, I think he's saying a little bit more than this. So. Each time light exchange, each time electromagnetic wave exchanges energy with the electron, it, uh, so it's not enough to say that amount of energy exchanged is uh, simply integer multiple of this, because if that was the case, um, there, this could get enough energy when you have low frequency of light. So really what, this is where you cannot avoid uh, introducing this idea that light is a particle. That when you think of interaction of light with the matter, you have to almost look at it like a collision between two particles. So light is a stream of particles of a certain energy that's colliding with this electron. And if that stream of particles, each individual particle has enough energy to pop out an electron in a single collision with a high enough frequency, then it would. But if in a single collision it couldn't pop it out, then before there's a chance for next collision, this electron would lose energy again. So this is where, like, if you are trying to avoid saying the word that light is a particle, you twist yourself into whatever jumble. So you end up having to say you are dealing with energy of a photon, which is the name we have given to this light particle. And energy of photon is Planck's constant times frequency of, um, well, I guess we are still treating it somehow like a wave because um, like it wouldn't make sense to talk about frequency unless we are still dealing with the electromagnetic wave, right? Like, suppose I asked you this, what is the frequency of this still ball? Is that a valid question even? Not really, right? If you're talking about it as oscillator, it has some thermal frequency, then that's one thing. But if I'm telling you, this, treat this like a point particle. 
it doesn't have any constituent parts, and what is its frequency? Particle doesn't have a frequency. <laughs> particle has a velocity, some momentum, those particle properties. Waves have frequencies. So in this expression, you are containing those two seemingly self-contradictory quantities. So we are treating this light now like a particle, but at the same time we are doing that, we are not getting rid of any of its previous wave properties. We are still treating it like a wave. So this is the bold assumption that Einstein made, and he turned out to be right. Uh, there's a guy, so one of the things you can do is you can then not treat this like a collision between a particle and another particle. So you could say, you know, you, you could say things like, um, so this is what your lab is about. You could say things like the maximum kinetic energy of the, the electrons that are popping out. Well, that must come from the energy of the photon. So that would be you know, Planck's constant times frequency of light. But well, this electron is somehow bound to the surface. It, uh, under normal circumstances, it doesn't just spill out of the metal. So there must be some kind of potential energy, uh, negative potential energy binding it. So you say, all right, so this is how much energy you are adding each time with each collision minus whatever potential energy that you need to overcome first. And this is what's called work function in your lab. So this is a pretty simple, um, like a simple sort of analysis of um, what must happen based on collision of two things that have energy or can have energy. And, um, and you know, once you have, you have electrons that are popping out with some amount of kinetic energy, then you can think of some electrical arrangement to, to try to measure this. That's what your lab setup is. <laughs> um, and, but this is a pretty simple prediction and that you would have, um, I guess this is the prediction that maximum kinetic energy of the particle popping out would be linearly dependent on the frequency down to some, the threshold frequency where you would have, I guess, you know, zero maximum kinetic energy, that would be H times the threshold frequency. So this would be a way of define, uh, figuring out what the work function is. So, so that's Einstein's theoretical prediction, surprisingly simple. Well, maybe because it's simple, somebody <laughs> did do the experiment like a few years after Einstein proposed it, and like a couple years after, I think. I think the experiment was done in 1916. And once you have a theory that's experimentally verified, now the Nobel Committee can actually give him the Nobel Prize that they knew had to give to Einstein at some point because he's a genius or something. <laughs> so, so this is a photoelectric effect. Once you get over this hurdle of hearing that light is actually a particle, then uh, it's actually mathematically pretty simple. 